Oh god, I'm miserable. My channel is floundering. I don't have a real job. My dick barely works. Man. If only there was some sort of outlet for me to project my inadequacies. Perhaps under a constructed guise of entitlement. What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Choopy Choosy, back in the clack with another extreme stream! Hey, listen, man. Welcome to the top five reasons you should not play Genealogy of the Holy War, and why those reasons are wrong, and Genealogy of the Holy War is actually the best game ever made. Oh, shoot. Did I forget to put that part in the title? Oh well, I'm sure no one's gonna mind either way. What are you doing? Do not click on that right there. That's not okay. You don't need to click on that. It's a prank. It's just a prank, bro! Ah! It's no secret that Genealogy of the Holy War is my favorite game of all time, so let's get that blatant bias behind us, bro. As a wee young choop, I approached this entry with no previous knowledge of it, or any of the Fire Emblem series for that matter. Needless to say, right from the word child hunt, I was immediately hooked. After multiple successive playthroughs, crying remorseful tears on partially translated manga, and an amassment of honestly really dumb tat, I had successfully and unknowingly cultivated my own self-serving fanboy bubble. A bubble that was rolled through the dirt and popped on a piece of discarded cinnamon toast crunch as soon as I entered that public sphere known as the World Wide Web. Uh, what? what? People don't like this game? Uh, how could you not enjoy what I enjoy? Okay, this one honestly has some points I agree with. Objective fact? Damn, that's a good line. I'm, I'm stealing that one. So while all criticisms are fair, I do believe that many of the gripes echoed online are just that. Echoes. Opinions that are stated, assimilated, then regurgitated over and over again until they basically become part of that game's narrative. What's worse is as someone who has never experienced genealogy in the first place, these may seem like valid reasons to never play the game. But they're not. And you should. So in this video, I'm going to argue against and attempt to disprove the top five most common criticisms against genealogy of the Holy War with my own arsenal of objective facts. This one's gonna be hot, so leave your training wheels at the door, ladies and gentlemen, and stay with me now. Let's take a look. Number five, the mechanics are not properly explained. All right, I know I said I would be dismantling and debunking these criticisms about five seconds ago, but I actually agree with this one. Aside from very few passive tutorial blurbs from these no-name villagers, there is no in-game explanation for many of genealogy's more nuanced mechanics. Things like the love point system, leadership stars, and weapon weight are seemingly left up to the player to figure out for themselves. However, I think it's unreasonable to leverage this critique as a flaw of the game itself. This game came packaged with this crazy thing a lot of products had back in the day. It's called an instruction manual, and it was there to instruct you on the complexity of the game without bogging down the actual experience. I think this ideology benefits the overall pacing, especially since this game warrants multiple playthroughs, and not having to trudge through a glut of redundant fourth wall breaking tutorials makes that aspect all the more appealing. I would argue that you don't even need to know everything about this game to actually enjoy yourself. Hidden game mechanics like the love point system are just as effective or even more effective at engrossing you when you stumble upon them by happenstance. Many canon pairings have ridiculous starting bases and even faster growths to ensure that you'll most likely have a harder time getting them not to fuck. I can speak from the personal experience of my first playthrough, not knowing anything about the mechanics and still having everyone, save for the dead bitches, to pair up and pass down. Even if they don't, yes, I know the replacement units are clearly worse alternatives, not having inherited skills, holy blood, or items, but that's why they're there in the first place, and if you do end up recruiting them, you'll probably have a more uh, unique experience because of it. Overall, I think this criticism is a product of the way we consume games as modern players rather than the game itself. Uh, we don't have access to this instruction manual or this handy dandy reference card here 
or either of these things in English for that matter, but what we do have is plenty of resources online for those who wish to supplement genealogy's overall lack of handholding and design philosophy. Number four, hidden items are too hidden. All right, even having this one here is frankly ridiculous to me, but it's a topic that's brought up so regularly that I cannot ignore it. Without going into spoiler territory, there's about two to four hidden events and items that are constantly leveraged as being design flaws, mostly because of how obtuse and obscure the requirements are for unlocking them. The argument usually goes as such. And yeah, this is bull dookie. I would have never found this item if I didn't look it up beforehand. That's the point! The game doesn't want you to find these items, especially on your first blind run. That's why they're so hidden. They're Easter eggs. You don't need them to be successful, and you definitely don't need them to have fun. Once again, this is a really, really good game that warrants multiple playthroughs. You cannot and will not see everything in just one run. These items are there for returning players to have more tools to play around with in their subsequent campaigns. And I will also note that there's a certain sentimentality around discovering these easter eggs from either more experienced players, word of mouth, or an online forum that incentivizes player improvement in multiple campaign sessions. Number 3. The Pawn Shop System Sucks To put things into context, the Pawn Shop is the only means for units to swap their items between each other. Units can sell any of their items to the Pawn Shop for half the weapon's worth, placing them in a communal storage box. And from there, any unit can buy back that item for its full worth to obtain it for themselves. The result of this system is an extra layer of strategy where the relevance of gold and item inventory is heightened beyond any other entry in the series. Because items are soft-locked to their respective units, the individuality of each character is amplified as a byproduct. For example, Ethlyn owns and is the user of the Light brand. That's who she is. She's my sweet, cherry-eyed, light brand baby. Now you still have the option to give that sword to whomever you want with the caveat of enough planning and resource management, but the item essentially becomes part of that character's identity and helps to establish and develop their own niche role within your army. It also deepens the decision-making behind defeating bosses. For example, setting up a kill for Lachesis on this boss does require a lot of planning and possible risk, but the enemy's Paragon Ring would benefit Lachesis way more right now if she manages to kill. And she wouldn't have to waste funds acquiring the ring later. It's a system that's not there to restrict you, but give you options, and have those options actually matter, which is what Fire Emblem is all about. Boo, why can't we just trade between units? They do it in literally every other Fire Emblem, and it's fine. They could literally just insert the option to trade, and it would make the game so much better. Well, this isn't every Fire Emblem. Judging a game based on another's mechanics is not a reasonable critique of anything. And besides, even if you did implement the free trade system, it wouldn't really make the game better. Uh, what it would do is completely undermine genealogy's core unique mechanics, which are pertinent and mindfully balanced around the pawn shop system. Presenting a list within a list of the top however many redundant mechanics there would be if free trade were a thing. Inheritance, weapon repair, equipping after canto, limited armory supply, the steel skin, unconsumable stat and skill boosters, lovers trades, thief trades, weapons with fucking 50% crit, individual unit wallets. So yeah, I'm not trying to say that one system is better than any of the others, whether it be the traditional, the Thracia 776 Unlimited style, or the pawn shop, as long as they're successful in their respective games, that's all that matters. And in Genealogy's case, the pawn shop system strikes the balance between mechanical relevance and player customization perfectly. Number two, units are imbalanced. Ah shit, here we go again. We're in the center of this overdone meatloaf and I'm about to lather you down with my special ketchup. Yes, the units are clearly imbalanced. For instance, holy weapons and holy blood bonuses are one hell of a powerful drug. Some would argue, too powerful. Holy blood gives massively inflated stats and gross. Even a unit with minor holy blood gets a total of 50% boost distributed to their respective stat boons, and units with major holy blood have double that boon with 100% overall increase. On top of that, the holy weapons themselves give anything from insane stat boosts to very useful combat skills when equipped. This all sounds super dumb broken, right? But here's the thing, it doesn't matter. This imbalance is the foundation of the game's story. 
Holy Weapons and Holy Blood are an example of designers actually utilizing the medium of interactive storytelling in a way that only video games can provide, using unique and practical game elements to represent story. I can be smashed over the head with text box after text box of expository dialogue explaining to me how Holy Blood is so coveted, how it forged nations, won unwinnable wars, decides the royal lineage of the future, and most importantly, grants godlike strength. But none of that dialogue is ever going to equate to the impact of taking your first toke of FORCE DEEP and witnessing that power firsthand, by your hand, through the lens of your own actions. A lot of peeps who call specifically for a remake with Holy Weapon rebalancing are incognizant that the power of the Holy Weapons themselves are fundamentally tied to the bulk of character and plot motivations. That's understandable because its integration is done so dang darn well. But diluting their representative power in gameplay would be diluting the entire story itself. The Holy Weapons are the story, and they're used on the enemy side as well. Engaging godlike units parked on castles with your own monsters makes these events all the more memorable. And speaking of gods, Sigurd! He's a really good unit. Some would say he's the best unit in all of Fire Emblem. And because of that, he's often used as argumentative fodder for the usual, oh, this game is imbalanced, so it must be bad, trope. He can solo the whole first generation. Yeah, he can with enough RNG manipulation, save states, stat boosters, or perhaps just an incredible streak of luck. But guess what, guys? Every Gen 1 unit can solo the game from their starting availability. Yes, even Arden can get so strong and tough that grunts will just give up and stop attacking him. What is this argument even? The extraordinary accomplishment of a few dedicated people, while commendable and deserves praise, does not speak for the overall balance or fun factor of a game. Yes, technically one unit can solo a portion of the game, but does that mean there's no point in using more than one unit? This man is playing Mike Tyson's Punch-Out blindfolded. Does that mean there's no point in playing the game with our eyes open anymore? These douches are playing Fire Emblem with negative growths. Does this mean that growths don't matter in Fire Emblem? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Sigurd is a spectacular unit for sure, but part of that stems from his leadership support bonuses, which will benefit your entire army, especially if you're trying to cultivate strong child units for the second gen or playing for rank. But Choopy, why would I even use half of these units in the first place when so many of them are obsolete? I get that if a unit doesn't fulfill a certain niche, or if they have a niche and they're simply outclassed, that unit is often considered useless. This would be a valid argument if it were any other Fire Emblem or limited deployment was even a consideration, but it's not. Every unit added to your army can be deployed at once and should be seen as a net gain regardless of their relative power. The more moves you get on your player phase to bust through red squad formations and dismantle the enemy's leadership, the better. And while some units are more integral than others, that's not to say they're completely irredeemable. Units who lack the ability to double with pursuit, are unmounted, or are locked to heavier weapon types make up for it in some way with varying degrees of success. Lex has Paragon, Noish has Acost and Critical, Duke can Steal, Telchu has Wrath, Lewin has... Force and Arden has... Well, Arden sucks. Just leave him at the castle. Somebody's gotta be the goalie. That's a given. It seems to me that the basis of this unit imbalance critique is that an imbalanced Fire Emblem is somehow a bad Fire Emblem. And if that's the case, I'm gonna have to strongly disagree with that one. I mean, if balance is that important to y'all, then why the fuck are you playing Fire Emblem? There is not a single entry in this series that cannot be broken to shit through either mechanical exploitation or external knowledge. I understand the merit of character balance in a competitive game like, say, Street Fighter or Warcraft, but Fire Emblem isn't a competitive game. It's a single-player, linear experience. Your units are all on the same side, they aren't competing against anything except the events of the story, which itself is facilitated by the game's deliberate and meaningful imbalances. 
At the end of the day, even if every unit in genealogy were completely balanced, fulfilled their own unique niche in the roster, and had competitive growth, spaces, and skills in relation to their availability, would it make the scenarios more engaging? Would it make the characters in the Motley crew you amass more believable? Would it make the game more fun? I guess it's all personal preference, but if the entries that strive for balance were any indication, the ones that by objective fact have superior gameplay, the answer to me is a resounding no. It might make the game more homogenous, but unless you're playing for rank, none of these quirks are going to affect your success or fun either way. Especially if you're apprehensive about your first time experiencing this fantastic game. Oh god, I'm in too deep right now. I'm going so deep. You know what I'm about to say! Oh! Oh boy! Oh! Number one, Genealogy of the Horsey War. AKA, these maps are too big and I hate them. Oh boy. Oh boy. How's Choosy gonna get himself out of this one? Yeah, this is basically an unwinnable argument. Because at the end of the day, if you're not into a persistent sense of scale and unparalleled attention to world building and continuity, well then, you're just not into it. If grandiose battles with multiple story threads, side missions and subplots interweaving themselves all in real time doesn't sound fun, I don't know what to tell you, dude. It might not be for you. What I can contend is the misnomer that because this game has such large maps, it doesn't respect your time. First off, this game lets you save your progress every goddamn turn. It even gives you an autosave feature in the option menu and four save states to use at your convenience. So I have no idea where this is coming from. If anything, out of all the pre-casual mode Fire Emblems, it might be the most respectful of your time. Unless you're playing for rank, you will never have to hard reset and start over from turn one, ever. I am honestly utterly baffled when I see comments or even full video reviews that seem to not know this feature exists. Like how the hell did you manage to play a 30 plus hour long game and not see the word save? Where I truly feel that this sentiment originates from is not the map size per se, but rather the map density. You can have up to 24 units to move on your player phase, and enemy squads can have even more than that. There's no enemy phase skip button, and even if you do turn animations off, you still need to deal with this fucking half second where mounted units apparently twiddle their dicks between attacking and using up their Kanto movement. What the fuck are you looking at? This shit adds up, I get it. The perceived bloat can also compound depending on the way you play this game. If you're coming off entries where turtling, blobbing up and waiting for the enemy to come to you was your go-to strategy, man. You might be setting yourself up for a slog. That's not to say you can't play this way. Uh, if you want to pace yourself with your setups, go for it. But just know, as a result, you're gonna have way more downtime moving units around with really nothing else happening. And for some reason, Yugrol is especially flammable. So movement is key. But Chuby, that's the whole problem. Unmounted units are left in Zidasto! While there's no denying the utility that Kanto units with 8 to 9 movement have, I feel that their dominance is really over embellished at this point. If you keep your footies moving towards the primary objective and partition your mounts to clean up and out of the way side missions, all your units will see their fair share of combat. I think that's the general flow this game promotes. However, as any good game will employ to break up monotony or potential gameplay fatigue, there are deviations from this flow. Chapter 2, Disturbance of Augustria, is one of these deviations. It occurs relatively early in the game, and if we look at the progression of the two maps that preceded it, it becomes apparent as to where this shell shock stems from. These maps are presented in a way that allows the player to tackle each objective linearly at their own pace. And this map throws it all out the window and says, this is war, and the objectives are not going to be fed to you through a funnel for your convenience. If you want to save all the villages and get all the rewards from side objectives, you're going to have to go out of your comfort zone and put the pedal to the pony to maximize your mounted movement. You can take a breather after you take this castle here and wait for your footies to catch up to you, but at that point you'll mostly say fuck it and just keep pushing north. Then once you take Castle Hairheim, you gotta push even further north to intercept these mercenaries. And then, on the complete other side of the map, the Fury makes a beeline to your home base, all the while Chagall's soldiers are advancing down this tactical trench! With the objectives of this game shifting at the drop of a turban, it's almost inevitable that your foot-locked units are going to be making that walk of shame back from Desolation Road, right? Well, 
not really. This game gives you so many tools to ensure that shouldn't happen. For starters, you have a warp staff and a return staff, each of which have 10 uses and can be infinitely repaired. So you really shouldn't be afraid to use either here. This little general guy here drops the return ring as if to say, Hey bruh, don't be shy now. But the biggest tool in your arsenal that you acquire in this map is the Boom Boom Babe herself, Sylvia. I love to dance. I know you do, girl. In my eyes, she's the most powerful unit in this game with the ability to give extra turns to four units at once. And hey now, wouldn't you know it, she's footlocked. Because of this, her initial utility isn't going to come from dancing on the front line. It's going to be ensuring that units in her movement range are getting to where they need to be. On top of all of this, you could just, I don't know, realize you're gonna siege every castle on this map and maybe moving your unmounted units into this dead end is a bad idea? You have around 20 units at this point. They don't all have to be chasing the same goose. If you think preemptively and allocate them as needed, you will be rewarded. Breaking away from the point A to point B grind and viewing these scenarios with a broader scope, that's the beauty of Genealogy's map design, an aspect that I honestly wish they expanded on in the final product. But hey, who am I to ask anything more from? The best game ever made, yeah! Hey, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a bit of a passion project for me, something I needed to get out before three houses dropped, and I'm kind of bound to petting waifus to stay relevant for a while. Thank you to Link King 7 for help with the script. If you guys disagree with any of the opinions in this video, make sure to go to his channel and tell him, Link in the Despacito, because he basically wrote the whole thing. I'm just an innocent bystander. Uh, I don't even know what half the words in this script meant, to be honest with you. Thank you to Puzzles B for the feedback. Really appreciate it. Don't fuzz on the puzz, as they say. And thank you to all these fucking patrons right here. What? How do they do what they do? Oh yeah, they go on my patron link on the Dispacito and give me the drive to keep on making videos just like this one. Really though, I can't thank you guys enough. I want to it. But I can't thank you guys enough for joining me on another quest to discover the mysteries of the emblem. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, y'all, stay frothy.